Hello, and welcome to This Is Us. I'm Becca King-Reed. This week, we're coming to you from the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation in Portola Valley with a special salute to veterans. This is the largest collection of 20th century military vehicles in the world, and we're going to get to take a look at a few of them up close. I am here with the Foundation's president, Bill Bowler, who is an excellent tank driver. Thank you so much for the ride in. You're more than welcome. Now tell me a little about this foundation. It's the most unusual one I've come across. Well, the foundation was created in the 90s to manage the private collection of Jacques Littlefield. And he uh, started the foundation and the collection originally to preserve, protect, interpret, and be able to display to people the technology that was used in fighting vehicles throughout the last half of the century. Now that, that seems like quite a task. What did you have to do to, to reach that goal? Well, of course, the first thing is to identify, locate, and uh, bring in the vehicles and determine uh, which ones you want in the collection. Uh, his ob objective was to find examples of all of the uh, different versions of the technology from the various countries to the various iterations. Wow, so how many tanks and, and other things did you have to collect to get there? Uh, there are about 275 pieces in the collection. It basically was uh, considered almost complete by him, but there's always, always that one elusive one that uh, you uh, can't find because it's so rare. Uh, of those 275 vehicles, uh, most people would uh, look at them and consider about 200 of them to be tanks. The others would be obviously towed artillery and things like that. Uh, it turns out that uh, technically uh, about 60 of those are actually meet the technical definition of tank, though. What's the te technical definition of the tank? Well, it has to have treads, it has to have armor, it has to have a rotating turret and a large gun. Uh -huh. and, and, and they certainly do have that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about this one, the one that we came in on. This is a Sheridan, correct? Yes, we rode in on the M551 Sheridan. It was used by the Army. It was developed in the 60s originally, deployed in Vietnam. Uh, an unusual thing about this tank is it's made out of aluminum. It's lightweight, and it was designed that way so it could be pulled out of the back of a moving airplane and dropped to the battlefield for the Army. It also is able of uh, floating and fording across rivers. Wow, aluminum doesn't seem like the ideal um, fabric to be making a tank out of. How did that work? Well, aluminum has the advantage of being lightweight, and that allowed it to be air droppable, which meant you could put more of these in the field and in uh, remote locations. But uh, the trade-off, of course, is that the armor is lighter, and that uh, has uh, its own concerns. In a, in a vehicle like this, you're trading off basically three things. You want the heaviest armor, you also want the biggest gun, but you also want the greatest mobility. So the design engineers have to decide between those depending upon how it's deployed. I'm joined now by its tour director and expert on tanks, Phil Hatcher. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Phil. Uh, we're welcome to the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation. Can you tell me about this tank? Yeah, the tank we're standing in front of uh, at the moment is a World War II German Panther tank. Uh, this is regarded as probably one of the best two all-round tanks of World War II. Um, this is one of only a few survivors left in the world. This particular one was pulled out of a river in Poland after 50 years underwater and completely restored here at the uh, MVTF uh, facility. So it's a very, very rare vehicle. We're very proud of it. And uh, it has a history, of course, it fought on the Eastern Front. Uh, the Eastern Front was the reason for these tanks being developed. And uh, comparing it to uh, 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 one of its adversaries, a Sherman tank, as a one-on-one -on -one, uh, adversarial encounter, this would be far superior. However, it, the Sherman was built in huge numbers. This was not. The Sherman was much more reliable than this. This had problems with mechanical failure, etc. For instance, if the transmission failed on this tank, which happened quite often, uh, if they could recover it, it took three days to fix the transmission. A typical Sherman would be about three hours. Oh so. my gosh. But the features on this tank that made it a killer were this enormous gun. Uh, this gun could destroy anything on the battlefield. Uh, it ranges of 2,000 yards plus, and of course it's very heavily sloped and thick frontal armor, which made it virtually immune to most Allied tanks from the front. That was a special development, wasn't it, the slanted armor? That's correct. The Germans got this actually from the Russians based upon their experiences during their invasion of Russia in 1941. Prior to that, their tanks were slightly different. Phil Hatcher and I are now in front of the Sherman tank. Tell us about this tank. What was this like in the war? This, uh, this tank, as you mentioned, the Sherman tank, was, uh, is probably one of the most well-known tanks of World War II. Uh, built in astonishing numbers. Between 1942 and 45, the USA built 49,000 plus of these vehicles. Um, it had uh, 
some good points and some bad points. Uh, the bad points, of course, were thin armor, so it was uh, easily destroyed. Uh, Germans would call these Ronson, lights first time every time. To the lighter. Can imagine what that means. But also, they're extremely reliable. They were good on fuel. They were very easy to manufacture and very easy also to maintain. So those were the salient points, and of course, there were lots of them. But they, they could be shot at a great distance. They don't have... They Correct. Not... I mean, the, a German Panther tank, for instance, could destroy one of these at 2,000 yards. With the gun the Sherman has, it, if it was within 500 yards of the front of that tank, it could still not penetrate the armor. What did it have to do to, to win a battle? Well, typically, several of these tanks, if it encountered one German tank, would have to engage it and try to envelop it. So the side armor on the tank is typically a lot thinner. The calculation was it took five of these to destroy one panther. But there were five of these for every panther. Well, one German tank commander said, you know, we can destroy up 12 of your tanks, but you always have a 13th. <laughs> so. Now, this one had a really interesting arrangement in the front. Tell us about Correct, this riveting yeah. section here. So the front, of, front of the tank holds the transmission, as does the panther tank we'd looked at before. However, the difference now is if there's a problem, you undo these bolts along here and on, on, underneath the tank, take that armor plate off and you can replace the transmission probably within three hours. Wow, and, and opposed, as opposed to the Panther, which, which is three days. So, so these could be repaired quickly Correct. and we're pretty good on gas? Yeah, uh, probably if they, you know, on, on a road march, they're probably doing about a mile to the gallon which is good for an armored vehicle. I guess good for an armored vehicle. Bill and I have one more minute to show you a really fun piece of equipment. Tell us about this contraption. Well, this is a, um, it's actually not a motorcycle and it's not a tank. It's a cross, it's a cross country vehicle called the NSU Kettenkrad. Uh, it was designed to be used by the German airborne troops and could be brought in by transport plane or glider. Uh, they're great in snow and mud, of course, and they're used primarily in Russia, although some are also used in North Africa. Once the war was over, these are kind of popular on the internet. What do they do with them? Well, uh, they're relatively inexpensive to collect as a piece of German equipment, and they're fast. I mean, they'll go well over 40 miles an hour. And you can steer it like a motorcycle? Absolutely. Well, you actually turn the handlebars on, if you're you know, on the road, and if you want to make a sharp turn, you pull them all the way over and it breaks one track or the other track to do a, a quick So you just like a, like a tank? Like a tank, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. And inside it sort of looks like a tractor. Yeah, it, it doesn't have motorcycle controls. It has a gearbox and pedals, etc. So uh, as I say, the handlebars are strictly for steering, not for a throttle control or anything like that. Well, this is really fun to see. Thank you so much for showing us around and letting us see all your tanks. We appreciate the invitation.